Hello and welcome to the Zenith Thesis Podcast. Uh, this is episode 11. Uh, this episode we're covering chapters 2 and 3 from part 3, Nursery of Book One Dawn of Octavia Butler's book, um, uh, first in the Xenogenesis Trilogy. My name's Richard Acton, and uh, my co-host, whom I'm extracting from a strange wall plant, uh, is... Michael Glinka. Hi, everyone. <laughs> How you doing, Michael? Good, good. Thank you very much. Thank you for extracting from the plan, you know. It was a good sleep, though. I enjoyed it. Yes, yeah. Some 250 years of solid napping. <laughs> Man, a 250 year old nap. Like, wow. And then you wake up and it's like, oh, can I have five more minutes, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always the way, right? <laughs> so, um, should we jump in with your, your predictions from last chapter about what's going on this time? Yeah, sure. So, um, in my prediction for chapter two, uh, this chapter will describe the first time Tate waking up and being a bit apprehensive towards Lilith, mm-hmm. as I think anybody would be, if you know, suddenly awake and you know, see a human, uh, where before you couldn't see anyone, just walls talking to you. And mm. I think I, I wrote down that it will be a struggle for Lilith to people get used to her in terms of her powers and, you know, just the fact that they're all locked in in the room. And we discussed it last time that maybe I'll try to predict who's going to be next person to awaken. And mm-hmm. I thought that it's going to be Joseph Shing and then Leah okay. Beedy. Or okay. Bead. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, not quite, but I mean, Leah's in the the second cohort, right? Yes, yes. Um, reversed. I would say the, hmm. the order was reversed. Hmm. Um, but you know, it's it's a, I I sort of expected um Lilith maybe dis, uh, deciding to that maybe more females first hmm. would be better choice. But hmm. um yeah, I mean you know um maybe let's get let's dive in to the yeah let's do the summary yeah yeah because um I think it will explain why. So the chapter starts hmm. with um startled Tate awakening. Uh, while in the middle of Lilith trying to get her dressed, uh, but then obviously, then obviously the post suspended animation reaction kicks in, where she suddenly you knows sh- shudders and you know falls on the ground and coughs and you know, and tre- you know tre- a bit of tremors and um, I sort of imagine it sort of being like I don't know, um, like in the movies when they show uh, the people coming out from the cryogenic suspend you know sleep. And they're just like yeah, shaking yeah. and stuff like I sort of imagine like or that. Like um uh when they wake Neo up from the Matrix, right? It's yes, yes, kind of exactly. Full of liquid. Exactly. It, it's a bit like that kind of situation. Absolutely, yes. That's yeah. that's a perfect example. I sort of imagine it it being like that. Because actually to be honest, mm. Neo's um um uh, that suspension is actually I think very similar to what this my uh, this here is, except for you know all the uh electronics are attached to it but hey yeah it's a bit more uh mechanical by bio- and a bit less biological than uh than this but yeah also you know being being in some kind of pod with like gel stuff mm, uh, mm. yeah i think we should do a matrix sort of discussion <laughs> at some point <laughs> <laughs> anyway um yeah. Let's go back. So mm-hmm. then, obviously, the, when the response to the um, the reaction to the suspended anima- animation starts to stop, um, Tate starts in conversation with, but live like a cold blood killer. I thought, just tells her to finish dressing. <laughs> I just, I just, okay. find, I just found it really funny that she was like, yeah, yeah, I just put on, you know, finish dressing up, and then hmm. we can talk later. Yeah, yeah it's a. Uh, 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 We'll definitely come back to this because Lilith's kind of attitude in this whole thing is an interesting thing to talk about, I think. I think it's maybe she tries to, like, um, you know, show that she's the boss here. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, obviously, because if she, if she shows any sort of uh, symptoms of being, you know, weak or something or hesitant, then I feel like it's like swimming with sharks. Hmm, true. But, but she's being, she's kind of, kind of curt, kind of short with people. Mm. Which I don't know if that's necessarily the best choice, but I, I don't know if maybe that's just a side effect of not having interacted with humans much for quite a long time. But yeah, uh, we, we can talk we can about a few more the, instances yeah. of that before yeah. we dive in. Yeah. yeah. So um, 
and then Liv tells uh, Tay that despite of all that, I the awakening, being ma able to manipulate the uh, walls and the plants, she's st she's a prisoner. Uh, whereas Tay refutes that, being more like a trustee. Um, mm. And you know, but Lilith tells her that whether it is trusty or not, she needs to awaken 39 more people and she thought that Tate was her best first choice. And as to why, she tells her that you seem least likely to try to kill me, least likely to fall apart and most likely to be able to keep with the others as they awaken. And the conversation continued by Tate asking questions where where they are, what's, what's, what was that big plant, while Liv telling her that the suspend the animation took over 250 years and they will go back on Earth, uh, they will be sent back to the Amazon forest and there are no cities left after the war. Um, Lilith was actually worried that Tate was too good for now, as in her behavior wise, you know, she was expecting mm. some sort of breakdown or something, but she was also very, uh, uh, she was really appreciating that few moments of normality um, that she was able to speak to another human being, you know, as, um, so I guess she was, maybe even though her behavior is as it is, but she does appreciate that she can talk to other humans. Yeah, yeah, because it seems that, um, Tate's very kind of on the level, right? She's taking this in stride pretty well, given the weirdness of the scenario with which she's presented. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, after eating, you know, getting uh, acclimatized, um, the conversation continued. Tate followed up with some more questions about Lilith, who she was, whether she knew more about Tate and why it took so long for her two years um, according to Lilith to become the trustee of Oankali and the chapter ends with Lilith telling uh, Tate about the Oankali but she doesn't really believe her to which res Lilith responds well sooner or later you'll have to you have no really choice on that that's where mm. the chapter ends so um, it was nice quick sh uh, chapter but it sort of I yeah, thought yeah first chapter was quite short um, I thought that it sort of um, show that the bigger problem, biggest problem, I think, in all of that is that problem of the belief of like trusting Lilith, right? Um, mm. Tate is sort of okay, more or less, I would say, uh, although she just awakened. But she's like, as you said, like, you know, she's taking it quite well, but, you know, it's still, she's still apprehensive of what Lilith tells mm. about her, their captors, right? That they're aliens. She seems. Uh, yeah, she's she's skeptical of the the claim that the Oankali are aliens, which is fairly understandable, I suppose. Right? Yeah, it, it just you know, if, if you don't have much else to go on, then someone tells you you've you've been abducted by aliens. The default is mm, yeah, they're nuts. But then again, uh, she showed you know building walls and you know the plant yeah. and stuff like that. So so it's not something that evidence. you would see there that would um contradict that i i think it's a uh, yeah it's definitely something because the the others later on have a similar skepticism and it's, i yes. think it's definitely an interesting question to discuss whether or not it it's warranted to believe what um that they are in fact in the custody i suppose of aliens right they're, they're mm. being held by aliens and what do they have to really go on with that i suppose they have their experiences in the solitary beforehand whatever might have been inferred from that they've got the alien looking technology um i suppose you know if you were to believe that you'd been in suspension for an extended period of time again you know how do you necessarily verify that but you know if you take a few of those claims and say i know there's been a big nuclear war the major technological powers of the time have been wiped out is it really that likely that we're now going to see Technology that's very clearly significantly more advanced. Yeah, you know, like the ability obvious. to do something like grow walls. Yes, yes. In the absence of global scientific superpowers, right? That's not. That's going to take a while. Um, no, that's absolutely so think, correct. So, I mean, hmm. it's. I mean, I, I'm looking forward maybe to when she actually awakens. Um, Joseph Sting, I think that was his name, the scientist, because uh, yeah, yeah, hmm. maybe he. Uh, maybe he will actually, you know, prove that there is some sort of, how do you call it, 
well, uh, maybe with his scientific approach, he will deduce what hmm. you just you know said. Yeah. And because it's interesting because the demographic of the people who were available for her to choose from, like most of them didn't have like a particular, a lot of them had kind of creative background. Yes, yes. So I suppose it's it's not always straightforward to infer like what level of technology would be needed to achieve something like growing walls, depending on what your background is, right? So if you, you have a, a certain perspective on it, you can go, okay, yeah, this is just not something that we could do anytime soon with our current level of technology that requires a certain amount of background in understanding where our current amount of technology oh, sits yeah you know? um, so it's you know it may be more or less difficult for people to judge that effectively it feels to me so just on that topic actually because um the onkali obviously did not want um like they wanted the humanity to start from the scratch like everything mm. all the technology that the humans had um, is gone, obviously, because it's mm. just the planet is being wiped, and who knows if the Onkali just completely decided to break down everything else that was there. Um, just you know, so it might be also the reason why um, Lilith, the most of the people that she had to choose from, are from more of a, um, as you said, creative or humanistic sort of uh, area. Uh, where basically there is no, because the Onkali obviously they are do not want the you know the science sort of to prevail. They want them to start from scratch, in a way. Hmm. Yeah, that's a a possibility, I suppose, behind the choice. Although I I suppose the I don't know what the what's the background rate, right? Exactly what proportion of the population would have been and I had a strong science background and how many of them would be more likely to be in urban areas and thus have been killed in the war and so on. So it might just be, it's not a, you know, like the priors are such that this is the population distribution you might see. Left um, behind, yeah. So, yeah, who knows. Also, we don't know what are the other 30 people, oh no, sorry. True. Uh, not 30, there were 80. Uh, 70, I think, right? Yeah, 70. We, we yeah. saw 10 dossiers and she's yeah. got 80 to pick from. So. Yeah. So there's yeah. 70, so we don't know who might be there. Mm. Um, mm. It'd be funny if there's some evil scientist genius <laughs> somewhere there. Anyway, why is it always the evil scientist? I don't know. What's, what's I don't thing? know. I, to, be, to be honest, like, but it always goes like this. Either there's an evil scientist or the scientists are always ignored. There's no way, yeah, there's no way in trope, between, like, there's ones like <laughs> scientists telling the military, oh, you shouldn't be doing this because this will really be go bad. They ignore them, mm. it goes bad. Surprise Pikachu face. And then there's the evil scientist <laughs> who basically, you know, um, just does everything in spite, because they can, because they're so smart that they just want to show off. It's like, why not just show the real population? Yeah, that, there is that this the kind of trope of the, the scientists who are kind of too obsessed with their work to, to be concerned about the ethical implications of what they're doing. Um, they're just like interested in doing the thing and then not actually concerned about its consequences, which when you consider the history of things like the Manhattan Project and the, um, the Silomar meeting about genetic engineering and all that kind of stuff doesn't really reflect the reality of the situation right yeah. the people who are working on this stuff are kind of acutely aware of the potential ethical implications of what they're doing and mm. often kind of you know agonizing about it and communicating with the people in power uh you know there's a lot of questions over um you know whether or not um they should publish sometimes work and, and there's a in those kind of circumstances where um i think it was i think it might have been was it Fermi? Someone had discovered something that was critical to uh, the possibility of creating a nuclear weapon mm -hmm. and was persuaded not to publish it by a couple of his colleagues um, after the war, or, or like around the time the Second World War was starting, so that the um, the, the Nazis wouldn't have access to this information. Mm. Uh, and there's a, a few things like that in in that kind of environment although more it's, it's relatively rare that there's kind of a conspiracy of silence around publishing a particular fact more common that it was just sort of political lobbying around the use of certain technologies yes yes i mean you know things like this change quite rapidly you know at some point i remember i don't know maybe a few decades ago um any encryption 
sort of technology was mm. highly um, um, protected technology, mm. right? You know, if America, if you came out, you know, if you tried to s- smuggle out some encryption keys, you mm. know, or any encryption technology, you would be jailed as a traitor. You would be tra- you would yeah, I, think, I think it technically encryption technology remains classified as um, arms. Yeah, but right. then the, uh, if you look what they're doing yeah. in them of the NSA and stuff like that, and basically backdoors everywhere, and so it mm. doesn't really like sound as if they're following what was you know, I know several decades ago. Well, yeah, it, it's not been practical to to have encryption technology be considered as arms dealing, and there's a a whole mess of the interface between encryption and and lawmaking that is not pretty in many different places mm. um it, it you know, presents a serious challenge for that interface right because you're effectively giving people the power to deny the state access to information but that's but denying everyone including the state access to certain information is the only way to guarantee the technology works right you can't yeah. really uh do otherwise including a back door just doesn't work as a as a sensible uh means of you know it, it just renders that te- the encryption technology useless because someone will find that back door and you know, it's more or less meaningless plus of course there's the issue of trusting the state to actually use it responsibly yeah which is difficult given the, you know the snowden revelations and so on show that they really can't be trusted with uh this kind of surveillance technology. Yeah, no, you're, actually, you're um, absolutely correct. Yeah, I suppose I mean, like, you might be able to do something where, with blockchain-based technology and smart contracts, where like somehow or other, um, subpoenas could be enforced in smart contracts, where uh, you'd have to have some kind of legal warrant to get access to a particular encryption key. But yeah, it's still kind of a it, it's effectively a backdoor that has some kind of guarantee, but it still has real world. The problem of trying to explain blockchain to some people, I mean, I don't really understand it that well myself, but trying to explain to other people, especially people, who are elderly people who are usually in the positions of power, like it's this technology is, I mean, oh, yeah. it, it is, there's a problem with the technologies, um, how technology is progressing so quickly that basically even nowadays people who are quite well versed in it also are start, starting to sort of fall behind in certain aspects. So it's it's this there's, there's there's that also that argument you know it's that that's mm, the problem yeah yeah that's it yeah getting the state to actually use stuff sensibly like you know if you listen to the the hearings with the the, the tech um company leaders and the, like the u.s senate i honestly it's just... i've i've heard few first questions and then i basically stopped listening because i was cringing so hard i thought i'm going to literally <laughs> turn like create a black hole like as if like uh, just uh. yeah it's just it's painful it's like personal tech support like i'm not understanding the difference between android and iphones let alone anything as complex as uh, blockchain technology yeah it's 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 yeah this is this is why there should only be paper ballots right (laughs) nobody should ever do electronic voting for a long time yes because people don't understand it and the way it's currently implemented without things like cryptographic guarantees and blockchain is ridiculously vulnerable and even if you could implement them people won't understand them well enough to actually be able to trust them and what you need is the perception of trust more than anything else and the best way to achieve that is just there's a physical piece of paper that people are looking at and counting right you Mm. can tell right that's uh, yeah uh, I would not be keen to introduce electronic voting uh, anytime soon, yeah. anywhere. And in fact, where it has been introduced, especially in the States, oh, roll God. it back. Yeah. Go paper. Go paper again. Well, anyway, let's yeah. maybe go back to the... Because we've uh, <laughs> yeah. went on the tangent. But our <laughs> beloved tangent has appeared again. So uh, where did we start? I've, I've to be honest, I just wanted to um, one thing to say. I, I, this whole conversation, I have no idea. I, I generally don't know how we just started. Like I, 
we just like to talk <laughs> about the stuff and then it just goes on and on and mm-hmm. yeah but going back to the chapter i just wanted to say that it really struck me and i also noticed that you wrote in your notes here that tate jumps on this whole trustee thing uh, like calls mm-hmm. lilith a trustee to don car like you know really quick yeah trustee of the own car like. yeah mm-hmm. it's just like mm-hmm. It's not entirely, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say trustee. It's like, it's like, it's weird. It feels to me like she is immediately thinking that, I don't know, Lilith, it's like basically, I don't know, cons- uh, a spy or sort of, uh, a con- hmm. um, what's the word, a confident? Uh, a confidant basically. Confidant? Yeah. Informant? Yeah, so it's like, you know, effect. it yeah. just feels to me like, you know, during the Second World War, if anybody talked to anyone that is German, you immediately were like a Nazi conspirer. So it just feels to me like it's imme- it feels like this to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm having too many too strong feelings about this, but it feels strange. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, I suppose the, um, what would it be? Uh, the, uh, East Germany would be probably the one where the most informants per head of population, right? Yeah. But during the, the communist era. Uh, <clears throat> when the uh, Stasi had like crazy high numbers of informants. But yeah, the, she jumps to this conclusion that um, yeah, Lilith is like a you know, this, this kind of trustee of whomever her captors are very rapidly after she wakes up, right? Without that much to go on, I think, because the only thing that's kind of differentiating Lilith from her in this situation is that she's the one kind of like waking her up and... Uh, clothing her but there's not necessarily kind of a there's no like indication. direct implication yeah. or indication yeah that Lilith is like a, a prison guard in this scenario I mean you know it, there was, she yeah. didn't see anything like Lilith going to a wall and whispering something to a, to it or something it's just hmm. you know it's like if, if you were awakened in a cell and there's another person there you know just taking care of you because they're also in the hmm. cell it's just like well yeah, it just feels yeah. a bit strange. Like, it feels to me like even though Tate might be the best choice, first choice, it sounds to me now that Tate is sort of like, oh, okay, I'll go on, you know, I'll go with the flow, but mm. um, the moment the opportunity arises, I'm going to take you down. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Don't know, it just feels so you think, to me uh, like. Tate's kind of more suspicious of Lilith than she's letting on, even. Yeah, I think. Uh, to be honest, in the next chapter as well, it actually is um um actually yeah let's maybe go to the next chapter too, so that it, because it literally, it shows next sort of the beginning what Tate says to Lilith that it really sort mm. of strikes that she she sort of is I don't know I think she feels like as she's as Lilith was a spy but uh, we'll get to it um, okay let, let's let's uh, do your prediction for the the next chapter sure so my prediction was that um chapter three will be like a continuation sort of of um Lilith trying to get Tate on her side you know like the sort of conversation wise and then maybe more people be, will be awakened um okay. so did you have any specific people uh at that time I thought that maybe still um will be Joseph Sting as the previous uh sorry Joseph Shing um from my Shing. previous um prediction will be the first the next person. Mm-hmm. So that was my sort of I thought I didn't write it down but I thought it'll be continuation from the previous prediction that still um the fella Joseph Shing is going to be awakened next. Okay and and Leah there's your other one so she was also on all the list and that yes, was, yes. That was correct. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Basically, the chapter three begins with um, the summary of like the next three days after Tate's uh, awakening, um, mm-hmm. where it basically it was described as mostly eating, sleeping, and having conversation with. And basically, at some point, um, Tate asks Lilith what she did before the apocalypse. And when Lilith tells her it was she was, she was starting to study anthropology, Tate sort of looks down on. Well, you know that sort of subject anthropology and spice saying oh, why did you want to snoop through other people's cultures like couldn't you find so- what you wanted in your own 
it's a, like okay that's not mm. what anthropology is just like what it just feels strange like that going back to that mm. um previous like are you not happy with like what you have you know are you not grateful for what you have in you know great america it's just like really i mean hmm. really yeah it is a, a bit of an old attitude right a, uh, especially 50s america for a black lady i mean really hmm. tate really <laughs> are you sure you want to ask those questions <laughs> yeah good point i hadn't thought of that it's just uh, like i don't know it just it feels to me like sometimes you know People have this attitude, and I catch myself as well in circumstances that, you know, you look down upon something because you feel it's it's not as important to the society as, for example, what you do, which is unfair, to be honest, because in mm. a- any developing society, the new things that appear or the old things that have been, always been there are necessary. It's just it's a normal mm. progression. So anthropology as an understanding of I know how the cultures develop and you know what different cultures there are and how they've begun and sort of finding the sources of different you know how the connections between different cultures is important because this is how we understand how the societies develop. So I don't understand why would anybody would look down on any sort of sort of like science doesn't matter what it is you know um, on that it just felt to me like it's really strange as if like that and especially that question is like. Well, you want to snoop through other people's cultures, like, um, as of what, like, what do you think I'm a spy, like a Russian spy or something in America? Mm. You no, know, it just feels feels to me like Tate is like treating Lilith as if like you know America's at the time, um, you know any commie bastards, uh, trying <laughs> to spy on the wonderful, full of freedom America. Mm. You know, it's just. But I say it's like other cultures and other languages often have useful things to find out about yeah right? yeah i mean you know you learn things uh, from other people find the good bits yeah yeah uh, all kinds of stuff weird features that your language or your culture lacks you find out that there's some other practice that uh, might be a, a good thing to incorporate yeah and it's this is what it responds to it as well it's like even though that was the reason why, because she did want to snoop and find places, you know, because she wanted to find something more sane, but what mm. the, you know, where she was, you know, obviously. Mm. Uh, but it was too late because, you know, as she kind of said, only USA and USSR counted. Um, mm. So it's. Yeah, it, she, she, she was kind of disillusioned with the culture of where she was at the time. Um, and she says. Right, rightly so, given what happened, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, like it's you know, yeah. if two cultures, two powerful countries are, you know, um there that have the power to an- annihilate everything, you know, it's obviously I want to find something that makes more sense, at least, you know, it's a bit mm. bit more sanity, be more ethical and considering also America mm. up America's approach to, you know, black people and just generally people of color and it's just like duh obviously I will be looking mm. for something better. But I don't know, it just feels to me like Tate is taking this approach as if, you know, it's... She takes what Liv says, but, you know, she treats... She thinks of her as if she's a complete, you know, a traitor or something. Someone who you shouldn't actually fully trust. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so you, you think seeing this as another manifestation of mistrust yeah. from Tate? Yeah, I think uh, so. Okay. It's just like... Yeah. it. Uh, because, for example, here, so it continues to have to what Tate responds, you know, about the whole two only two sort of uh, civilization that really count. And she was like, well, human beings are more alike than different. I'm sure more alike than we like to admit. I wonder if the same thing wouldn't happen eventually, no matter which two cultures gain the ability to wipe out one another out along with the rest of the world. And that makes Liv sort of laugh because, yeah, on Kali pretty much think the same and that really feels like it, di- it disturbs state like she feels mm. like oh the captors think the same as me i like you know it's it, what the hell like you know it's hmm. yeah it's interesting because it, it seems like um lilith is quite skeptical of the you know she, she was clearly somewhat disillusioned with the the culture that led to this mess but at the same time she thinks that humans can do better yeah and and the oan kali uh are, you know are not right about humans being doomed if left to their own devices uh 
whereas uh and uh, yeah, seeing this kind of amusing irony in in Tate uh seeing it the same way mm. <laughs> so it's just it feels mm. to me like you know Tate is behaving a bit strange like you know she feels like oh here's a you know trusty uh, a traitor and then when she tells oh you actually you think very similar you know you know to Onkali and she's like oh my god like how could I have the same thoughts as you know my captors like how dare mm. that is like what really yeah. I don't know it just feels yeah. to me like maybe even though she might be the best choice but I would probably go with Joseph Shing if I had the choice. I don't know. Well, mm. well, we haven't been introduced to him yeah. yet, but I feel like maybe, maybe him, as the first sort of the intuition that Lilith had to pick him out, is probably the best choice. Mm. But who knows? Okay. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, mm. Yeah, we we kind of a while back. I forget which episode we already talked about the whole nuclear war thing, mm-hmm. but. I was brought up again here between the US and the USSR. I just wanted to note that between the last conversation we had about nuclear war and this one, um, I listened to some to a podcast called the I think it was, uh, the Brink, mm-hmm. which is um, about uh, the current state of nuclear, um, current risk of nuclear war, okay. right, which is alarmingly high, right, uh, at least as high as it was at the peak of the Cold War in many ways. Uh, for the possibility of accidental nuclear war um and there's an episode about Seoul presidential release authority uh which i watched immediately before that axios interview with with trump uh, with jonathan swan yes um which i do not recommend because like watching that interview with uh, the acute awareness that there's a guy standing in the next room with a nuclear football which would permit trump to like annihilate the world with like five minutes notice is yeah a, a very uncomfortable thing to do <laughs> yeah I, I feel to be honest this whole idea that there is a possibility of this happening and there's this basically a moron who could just press you know just go for it i mean i hope there are some the, security it, sort of stops that you know before it actually happens but that's the thing that they're really so it, it, in the the problem like the the biggest risk for nuclear war is not um a purposeful engagement in a nuclear war cuz the mutually assured destruction says that you know that's a stupid idea right the problem is not starting the war the problem is accidentally starting the war yeah. because uh <coughs> excuse me it almost alarm, happened in i think march with the iranian general uh i didn't know about that do you not know because um, um, Trump yeah. ordered um, a bombing of a airport where the Iranian oh, general yes. was? So it almost mm-hmm. we were almost there. Yeah, although it's kind of the the scenario is is a, a bit like the I mean the, the famous one with Stanislav Petrov or relatively famous where there was a, a technical false alarm right where their ah, yes, their system yes, was yes. saying that um, you know there was a, an American nuclear first strike. And they, you know, very nearly responded. If you know, if someone else had been on duty, there was a decent chance that they would have fired back, and then the Americans, in turn, would fire back. Right. So it's that scenario because it becomes a um, like unless you fire back within five minutes or so, you lose your retaliatory strike strike capability in the form of land based ICBMs. Mm-hmm. So if you have land-based ICBMs, their position is known. So a nuclear first strike can take them out and reduce your retaliatory capability, which reduces the decision window for whether or not you're going to retaliate to a really short time frame, which means if there's ever a false alarm, the president can be woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning and told, you have five minutes to decide. And this is it's happened right it's been that it's almost been that close so there was a situation where i think it was the um i forget which administration but um a president was very nearly woken up in the middle of the night because of a false alarm because like, some guys at norad left the simulation tape in and they thought there was a nuclear first strike because it was the drill running and not the real thing man oh man 
and the, yeah, there's been a couple of scenarios like that where it's just been some kind of technical error has got them like ridiculously close to accidentally starting a, a nuclear conflict. <sighs> Honestly, and, we need to get rid of nuclear weapons because... I mean, the, the first problem is getting rid of the land-based ICBMs because that's the major source of the time pressure. Because, like you, because nuclear first or nuclear retaliatory strike capability in the form of air and submarine-based missiles has increased to the point where we could completely obliterate, uh, you know, Russia if they launched the first strike on us means that you don't need the land-based leg of the triad, mm. which is the one which has the time pressure. Yeah. Pressure. Right. So if you lose the ICBMs that are in silos in Nebraska or whatever, then there's no risk of losing them when conflict starts. So the time pressure goes way back down. You don't have this ridiculous five-minute decision window where, you know, yeah, the- drunk Nixon in the last days of his office is, suddenly gets the call, right? That That's the problem. <laughs> you need the situation where it's not one guy who has to make a call in like a five-minute time frame because whomever that person is, whether it's uh, you know, someone who's more reasonable and you might expect to make a good decision, it's still a ridiculously bad situation under which to make that kind of decision. It's, it's horrifying. Like no one human should have to do that. It's horrifying and honestly, it's just... Yeah, it's it's something that we really need to get rid of all the nuclear weapons because there will be someone who eventually will do that. Yeah, well, it's this, this question of like mitigating that mitigating that risk of accidentally starting a nuclear war because then it's just uh, right. I mean, it, it, imagine like, imagine we're in this book, right? We have to explain, and if, if this war was accidental, how embarrassing is it when we're saying to the Owen Carly we uh, blew each other up because we left screwed the up. tape of uh, you know, training <laughs> tape in the computer yeah. and basically our, uh, yep. our daughter country thought it was an actual attack and is like okay mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yep cool I mean yeah I think I think when it came to if it came to the multinational societies you now, we would be a laughing stock for the rest of the eternity. Like to be teaching <laughs> in the books, you know, tech in the history books about, you know, what not to do when you develop a society. Basically. Mm, yeah. I mean assuming that anything remains, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. There, there's a distinct like, the the magnitude of the like risk of nuclear engagement i think is somewhat underplayed because people still think in terms of like the hiroshima and nagasaki bombs but we have and there no no no. those are like firecrackers now this is like yeah this is nothing now what we have now are these like, literally yeah the warheads on one of those old hours oh, at the the titan twos like close to 30 megatons Right, that that's more explosive power in a single warhead than every bomb that was dropped during the Second World War, including the two nukes. <laughs> yeah, it's right, all of it, like every one, all, you know, all of the bombing and all of those raids of Europe. Add, yeah, add it all up, and you still don't get to one of those warheads that's in a Minute Man or a Titan II. Right, it's, it's nuts. And we had thousands of those things. We still have about a thousand. Um, we do, we do. And it's... Those kind of magnitude from the US and the Russian sides, and this build up again. But uh, you know, we had even more. And if even like tens to hundreds of those goes off in our atmosphere, there's a decent chance that we could trigger a, a nuclear winter type scenario. Which uh, you know, there was some suggestion that had been debunked, but that's. A genuine possibility, right? We would certainly have a very serious climatic impact that would probably render I things. Mean, climate, you know, one thing: climate. Second thing: radiation. Third thing is the mm. gamma um, radiation that would basically kill all the electronics, basically rendering a bus back to the medieval times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the whole EMP thing. Yeah. We don't have that many hardened electronics. Yeah. So um, basically, mm. for anybody listening to this podcast. We do truly believe that the only choice, the only way forward is to get rid of all the nuclear weapons because otherwise there will be one day that this may happen and Mm. 
this book okay. is actually a good reason, exp- you know, a good explanation why we should not do that. Why should they should hmm. be there? Uh, but the, the the target of nuclear zero is, is kind of a long way off. But we, you know, you you can make the incremental changes, like getting rid of land based ICBMs that reduce the possibility of this happening. Right. So this, like, that's the goal. But there are plenty of instrumental things you can do in the meantime toward before we get there. But also those land based ICBMs, like. A lot of them are not in the state anymore to be actually used. Oh, yeah. So they're just there as a sort of, I don't know. Well, that's that's the thing, right? The US is, they have a whole new program now um, under Trump to refresh that arsenal. Ugh. And they've been letting treaties lapse really? with Russia. Really? That, like the New START treaty is about to lapse. And they're going to spend trillions of dollars replacing their nuclear arsenal with up-to-date versions oh, because i mean goodness. at the moment they're like they're still running you know targeting computers that you have to update with like five and a half inch floppies right it's crazy it's ridiculously antiquated tech for some of those old missile systems but uh i know and there's issues of degrading warheads and all the rest of it but uh there's a lot of money being spent to refresh that um i did not i was not aware of this planned. my goodness hmm yep it, it, it's a big problem because there's a there's a risk of further build up and there's a uh, you know Putin's been posturing with new um, formats of nuclear weapons and, and Trump's been giving indications that he wants to introduce um, more tactical nukes, uh, which is long been believed to be a, a strategic problem in nuclear war, which is we, we back down on those kind of small like backpack nuke yeah, type yeah, things yeah. that were popular with like the CIA in the 60s and all the rest of it. Because it, it's it starts the possibility of a nuclear engagement off smaller, right? If you have a tactical nuke, you might think you could actually use it for something militarily, which means you could start a nuclear war. Yeah. But if you have a in a, a, a 30 megaton bomb, you can't do that. That, that there's, there's nothing that's tactical you can do with that, right? That's just a huge smoke and hole on the ground. Right? Yeah. You, you, yeah. Yeah. It's it guaranteed to kill a huge number of civilian targets, right? So it, it prevents that kind of accidental slippery slope route into nuclear war. So you don't, you actively don't want tactical nuclear weapons. But of course, it, some people don't get that. Yeah. I mean, this is. Uh, <coughs> yeah. yeah. I think we should finish this because it just talking about this gets me depressed because it's and it's horrifying oh yeah sorry i've, I've been reading a bunch about uh <laughs> nuclear war stuff so i I've, I've got to yeah yeah i mean it's no no it's it's good to have a conversation about this because it, it does i mean the book itself shows what the problem would be if there is mm, i mean exactly the book shows a solution to all to this problem right that someone from other planets may come in and try to save us as in like trying to save an endangered species because that's what it is but <laughs> yep. again in reality, very embarrassing right? very embarrassing but aliens it, have to show up to sort us out but in reality it would never happen like in reality we oh, would yeah. just basically say goodbye to each other that's it there's nothing mm. else left so yeah it's mm. just yeah I believe that this, if it, this is what, as you're telling, that they're trying to refer, you know, refurbish all this, it's, it's really not a good idea. Really not. Hmm. Um, on the other side of the equation, they're actually very close to signing a, a bill into international law that would make it illegal to have nuclear weapons. Oh, really? Um, bas- bas- a huge number of nation states that don't have any nuclear weapons have signed a treaty at the UN, which would make it illegal under international law to own nuclear weapons, similar in structure to the landmine How treaty. How would then um, that be? Um... That's yeah. So it wouldn't it wouldn't immediately be enforceable, obviously, yes. but it would be a strong kind of instrument that would uh, kind of force that agenda towards pursuing nuclear zero. Um, I mean, you know, through the only way I can see this is that one politics, like as in changing in the poly, leader, poly, 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 leading politicians who are uh, mm. leading the countries that have those nuclear weapons. That's one thin way to to solve this. That will, you know, mm. agree to remove. But secondly, just I don't know, putting uh, economical, you know, sort of trading uh, restrictions on those countries and just yeah. Yeah. isolating them. So it- 
it would go a long way towards making it easier to 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 pursue that political agenda because you know if it's illegal under under international law it's harder to to get away with doing something like you know renewing the whole program yeah. the way they're planning to in the states it uh, you know, becomes a whole other set of hurdles mm. Well, anyway, but let's, yeah. Let's, so returning. Yes, I off think this other when I actually do the references for this episode, <laughs> there's gonna be like at least like twenty minutes of this episode, just basically a long conversation about nuclear weapons and war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry about that. No, I, I think it's good. It's good to talk about this and you know bring up some news about it, you know what's happening in the world because it is all yeah, current. It's, so it, it's, it's worth being aware of, of because people think that it's. You know, that was the Cold War. But it's still it's kind of done now. No, it's not. It's continuous. still a thing. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so back to mm. the chapter. Um, we have we are at the point where Tate is actually having really difficulty in believing that um, it's the you know a captivity of an a- of aliens. But Liv mm. basically shrugs it off and says, it "Doesn't matter because you'll see them anyway." And at some point, it's it doesn't matter whether you believe me or not. But this is what's going you know this is the fact and mm. so the next two people they are to awaken are Leah uh, Bead and then Celine Ivers surprisingly to be honest because she was one of those people who that was very you know prone to breaking down and crying so uh that took me by surprise and the next two people after that were Kurt Lower and Joseph Shing um mm. Kurt being the policeman yeah, well, um yeah i i think that um uh, Celine makes sense in light of Kurt being next. Yes, right? yes, that's exactly Lilith what this... uh, Lilith's um, train of thought is that because yeah. he will have someone to protect. That's her strategy, yeah. right? She wants. Uh, she thinks like it's, whilst like Celine was was prone to kind of breaking down, she also had some, I think, some potentially useful characteristics. I think, and then she wants something to diffuse Kurt, right, to make sure that he's got someone to look after because that seemed to be his. His pattern, yes. When you know, uh, which I think is a pretty, uh, a fairly smart strategy. Yes. So yeah. she does not want to awaken any man yet, even though it Tate thinks it'd be better to sort of, you know, considering the whole situation, Paul Titus, to you know, f- fight that I don't know the apprehension that may Lilith may have against men, uh, to actually awaken the policeman, but. Um, Lilith believes that, yeah. as you said, since there's no one to protect, he basically, and you know, there's no one to protect to God, he would basically screw them all up. So it's, I think it's um, mm. better not to. Um... Yeah, because I think it was uh, Lilith had told Tate about her encounter with Paul, Tides, Paul yeah. Titus. So, and Tate thinks that Lilith is like. Over overcompensating in some sense but I, and not waking up any men. Yeah, but I don't think that's the case. I think it lives harder than that. No. And but basically also says that the reason though is that um there are someone Kali that will protect Lilith. Obviously, no. Um, mm. we have Nikanj and you know um his family. But there is at that point with Paul Titus, there are some who would allow Paul Titus basically to rape her, but they wouldn't allow mm. her obviously to her him to kill her, but so basically, the sol- conclusion is what Lilith tells Tate is that they're on their own, and the base, mm. and they need to make the best choices they can to who to awaken to make sure that this sort of society of death doesn't collapse. Yeah, yeah. She thinks that whilst the Owen Carly might intervene, they might not intervene soon enough to prevent uh, people from getting yes. hurt. Yes. So. Liv then gets down to business and starts looking for the women she was supposed to awaken and uh, which, you know, but going, touching the wall, but then she gets spooked by Tate um, saying, there's nothing there, you know, as if like, you know, she was spying on Liv, trying to figure out what is the trick she's using and she's, and Liv's like, without looking, she's like, just go away, okay? So, um, so that's mm-hmm. basically, but it's in- interestingly, we find that actually the wall opening is was made to be physically pleasuring. Um, if you have to do something, it might as well feel good, Nikanj told uh, Lilith. And he had become very interested, Nikanj has become very interested in her physical pleasures and pains once its sensory arms were fully grown. 
Happily, it had paid more attention to pleasure than to pain. It had studied her as she might have studied a book, and it had done a certain amount of rewriting. So it seems that the can mm-hmm. spent some time on Lilith trying to understand her, like trying to make her time pleasurable, as much pleasurable as possible. So uh, I guess, you know, it's it's interesting way, you know, this, uh, to make her task less annoying i would say hmm. yeah it's, it's an interesting one uh, I, I we kind of it, it, it's it's odd to have this from this perspective right because it's kind of a, a a little retrospective on that time that um in that time skip where nikanj was was doing this and there's not that much detail but i i can't imagine lilith being overly comfortable with him like messing around with her sense of pleasure and pain right i, I think that would be uh, it's that must have been an extended process yeah it sounds like i don't think he would do something like maybe what um uh what was uh kaguya would um think maybe Mm. of like you know electrocuting her or something just to see the reaction (laughs) i don't think he would do that but i think um they probably sat down and he would ask her like tons of questions trying to feel Mm. her reaction and body reaction as well while i know what how would that how would you respond to that and blah 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 so it's interesting i yeah, think it's yeah. quite and the whole uh certain amount of rewriting thing mm. that's hinting at the you know, more changes than we perhaps have uh, got explicitly yeah you know, like they've been rooting around in her genes and up to something it's it, it, actually it, to be honest i didn't think about it like you know being modifying lilith so that when she uses the you know the walls like it brings pleasure it's like huh this is interesting so basically using this chemical mm. stimulates the pleasure uh the you know sort of neural a new um mm. pathway in her i suppose it would, it would it would kind of make sense right if you were designing an interface that was like direct brain stimulation type stuff you would kind of want to tie that to like yeah Oh my god, that really reminded me. Pleasure sensation. That reminded me. I don't know if you remember this movie with Sylvester Stallone, Demolition Man. Uh, no, I don't think I've oh seen it. Oh my. Okay, so maybe I don't know if you were you like action movies, but this is a really old movie with mm-hmm. um, uh, Sylvester Stallone when he's awakened, same like Lilith, but in future mm-hmm. after like a sort mm-hmm. of because he was a policeman and he awakens after. He was frozen down because some people died in a... But he was trying to arrest someone and then people died. So there is a punishment. He was frozen down and he was defrosted, I don't know, maybe 50, 100 years later. Hmm. And basically okay. the society is much different. Like there's a lot of limitations of what people can do. And it's like very... You can do this, you cannot do that. You, can, you know, very... This type of society. You cannot swear... Uh, it's pretty as an action movies go you know Sylvester Stallone at that times you know it's okay but there's one okay. scene where there's this you know girl he, he meets and they're supposed to have a sexual intercourse but the sexual intercourse is actually um, like they put these helmets on and in through their visualization sort of they, the, the helmets cause the pleasure in their bodies but they don't actually physically touch so when you huh. said that you know that you no know, um uh, if you develop an interface that's you know that, that basically reminded me of that that the sort of the interface mm. sort of is just i just thought about it, it's just like yeah that's really sounds like that yeah yeah although i was thinking kind of on more uh basic levels of just like uh you know if you were like a, a user interface designer for something that was um in a, a way of interacting mm. with some computer system or whatever and you could directly like make this kind of change in what sensation people are experiencing when they do certain things with the user interface right it seems like that would definitely be a thing that yeah. people would play around with yeah. right they make it pleasurable to do certain tasks right? <laughs> i mean to an extent that's already what they're trying to do right you're you writing know, a Facebook's giving you dopamine hits. Yeah, you're writing a program. Yeah, literally giving you dopamine hits. <laughs> you're writing a program, and if you have a bug, basically electrocutes you. It's like, oh, oh. Hmm. Yeah, you looked away from your Facebook feed. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dystopia. Lovely. Lovely dystopian. 
1984 speak, uh, shouting at us. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> so Lilith then shows uh, Tate the plants, uh, you know, with the human still inside of and just describes her previous experience of almost being sucked in. And she warns Tate, you know, about this, don't do it. And what happens? Obviously, Lit, Tate puts her hand in and... <laughs> And starts to get sucked in and cannot get released, and basically, but luckily, Liv can stop it. And it's just like, are you even listening to me, Tate? Like, I just felt to me like this whole situation was like, oh mm. yeah, this happened, so you shouldn't be doing this. And she just puts the hand in. It's like, really? Yeah, I I got the distinct impression that uh, so the uh, Tate sticking a hand in the plant after Liv had told her that you know the plant will not let go if you do that uh, and that uh, Lilith could let could release the plant it, it felt to me like Tate taking advantage of that situation to try and demonstrate trust in Lilith it feels like she's trying to build a, uh, a, a relationship there I don't to put some something in the bank as in like by in that relationship by like you know trusting her that she will do what she just said that you know yes uh, but it sounds really manipulative and actually she was very manipulative according to the exactly right from from having read her profile and seeing this i was like it seems it's a relatively small gamble it takes a little bit of trust from tate but it it establishes a a, a reciprocal relationship right and there was a little bit of that earlier as well with um with tate sharing her um her history before the war with Lilith and so on. And you know, Lilith was kind of reluctant to share back and only gave a, a little bit of her history. Yeah. But no, that's an exploiting reciprocation pressure, right? You tell someone something or you give someone something and there's an expectation that you, you reciprocate. Yeah. Um, so this kind of, this talented natural manipulator, right? She's, uh, I think this is a, an example of that, right? She's uh, establishing a, uh, that relationship because uh, doing something um, like requesting a favor of someone is a great way of getting people to actually um, it's sort of, uh, like you and be likely to engage with you later right because you've established a sense of, of indebtedness to that person mm. uh, which is actually it's a very useful initial social relationship because it puts them kind of uh, uh, like above you in the, the status hierarchy and, and it's a uh, kind of classic social manipulation techniques. Yeah, so it just felt to me like this. Um, yeah, I can see now in this perspective why she did it, but like, in the same time, it's just like really, why? Like, uh, but anyway. So yeah, but I also see the note you made about the um, the plant, and yeah, actually, because hmm. in the book it said that. Um, it had like it rotated the people inside of it, just to sort of like stimulate yeah, the muscles. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's apparently the the plant was kind of moving around um, as Lilith took it out of the wall, which was kind of unnerving. Tate, which is you know, understandable, mm. right? Giant moving plant pod thing. Um, but the the movement it really makes sense for the plant to move around to prevent muscle atrophy, right? Because you, you don't want to be sat still in a pod forever, and because then your muscles would just not move but if you're being moved around i suppose that might help to maintain a certain amount of muscle mm -hmm. tone um although i don't know how well that would work without nervous stimulation um yeah, it, yeah it's, i don't really know enough about uh, that. it's it's it doesn't sound like you know without this nervous stimulation that the muscle movement like even the body moves doesn't mean that the muscle movement is um actually working as it's supposed to be Hmm. So there has to be electrical, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe would. electrical stimulation as well, like some sort of movement that like electrical impulses going through the plant, but still, hmm. well, possibly, it's quite. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it it occurred to me that this movement of the plant would probably have to be an engineered feature, unless there's some weird thing going well, on with the ecology of the plant, you because it doesn't really make sense for me for the because what's said is the plant was rotating so it could expose its more of its surfaces to uh, sunlight, which is not, as far as I'm aware, it's not really a behavior you see in... No, but this plant in particular was um, in the wild was basically 
attacking, well, using small our animals basically that were got too close to it and they're sucking them up to for nutrients, right? So it makes more sense to yeah. like, you know, the be- the quickest way to dissolve something is to stir it. Any solution you put in water, as long as you stir it, it's going to mm-hmm. dissolve fish. Uh, that's a good point. So yeah. in, when you move it around, it basically allows for the digestive um, uh, solutions to but wasn't, break it down. Wasn't it supposed to be keeping them alive well, yes, in the plant? Part, yes, but in the wild, as you described that, I would say that this is um, how we know. Obviously, it's to want to keep them alive as po- long as possible, but at the same time, it wants to use their mm. nutrients because in the wild, it was eating mm. those uh, animals. I think that in according to the the book, it wasn't supposedly the nutrients that it was primarily after. It was um, was it the the res- the respiratory capabilities of the animal? It was it was doing something with with gas exchange, like making use of their their respiration um, to get. Uh, carbon dioxide or something um, which I, it, it got me thinking maybe whatever's going on on this planet is is there's some reason that the um, like the biochemistry is not very efficient mm. right all the chemical reactions are running slowly because yes. if if you were turning over to try and expose a surface differently to sunlight what you'd need for that, that to make sense would be for some processes that use that sunlight to be the the bottleneck right you, you want to get some sunlight and then you need to do something with the results of yes. that um whereas as far as i'm aware that those biochemical processes are really not the bottleneck for anything here which is why you don't really see this kind of like rolling behavior in plants you just have something that occupies as much surface area as possible and that's it right because it doesn't matter where on the plant is exposed so long as a sufficient area is because the bottleneck for using that light energy is in is not um is the light energy itself right it's not a biochemical process but if the bottleneck was further down then i could see why you would want to like periodically expose different parts to sunlight so that that, i'm probably going too deep into trying to understand why the ecology of this plant makes sense um. Well, no, no, you're right, but I, I thought <laughs> I didn't remember that it was for the. I thought the plant basically, um, wanted to trap those animals inside of it because one, maybe it was after the carbon dioxide, um, but for that you need to have oxygen, um, exchange right to carbon dioxide mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. animals. But I thought also it was mostly because it wanted to dissolve the animals for the nutrients that. It was more a carnivorous animal, like you know, Venus flytrap. Yeah. So the the book said it wanted them for the gas exchange, and then we said that um, on you know, on our planet, why carnivorous plants want to, to eat something is to use their protein primarily, because yeah. that makes sense with respect to our ecology. But I'm kind of trying to justify the way it says it works in the book. True. Maybe I am too <laughs> focused on the perspective. I'm shoehorning it back yeah. in. Uh, but. Yeah. Maybe to focus yeah. on the too much on the earth side of the um, hmm. uh, ecology. Well, anyway, so basically, what happens next hmm. is that they remove Celine and basically live, just leave State in charge of her while she goes to awaken Leah. And as she was about, you know, when they're all taken out and then dressed up, and as she was about to sit down, Lilith was about to sit down with Celine Tate. Leah attacks her from behind, trying to uh, we're trying to strangle her. Um, and the sudden attack made them both fall on the ground towards the ground. And but in the time, like Lily was thinking, damn it, if I fall on her, I may hurt her. So she just sort of tried to twist herself um, with uh, to the side and considering her enhanced strength and maybe some other things enhanced. That considering that she could think of it all that while they were falling on the ground, um, mm. she tried to make not wall land and then to prevent any injuries and so. And then she easily, so though by pretending she's having trouble, but she could easily remove the chokehold. And it's like, will you stop it? She started. I'm a prisoner here just like you. I can't let you out. I can't get out myself. Do you understand? So, um, mm. yeah, it's interesting because she, she definitely seems to have quite significantly enhanced strength. Yes, now. it sounds um, like quite significantly. And also the senses are like sharper. So I feel like mm. now Lily is like a perfect um, assassin. Basically, you know, for uh, <laughs> just hiding her true powers, but you know, it's uh, 
But yeah, it's just quite like, yeah, yeah. I, she could easily remove the but she pretended to be like choking more than she actually was in the coughing and, you know, but in reality, you know. Yeah, I think she's kind of deliberately not. Uh, show off her strength. Showing off her full capabilities, yeah. right? She wants to not freak everyone out by being like totally indifferent to Terminator. a reasonable sized person just like attacking her. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, there was this bit that made me think maybe there's a bit more to the kind of perceptual side of this because it said time seemed to slow down for her mm. um when uh, uh, uh what was it uh leah yeah when leah grabbed yeah. her um but it struck me as uh, you, you could definitely interpret that as just you know the way that normally happens with adre- adrenaline right you, i mean you know things happen like this people do it. have amazing mm. reactions sometimes when adrenaline kicks mm. in like you know a woman lifting yeah. up a car because her child got trapped underneath it and you know the sudden reaction of so i would i would maybe it's just adrenaline i would say it's just probably adrenaline yeah. being suddenly attacked after being you mm. know confinement for so long the adrenaline can kick really quickly but um, but maybe it's something definitely that, feels within the, the like the, the realm of normality. Could but be something more in this kind of environment where there's you know, the possibility of enhancement. It kind of it, it hints. Uh, for me, it's always kind of um, whenever there's we've got this kind of subtle Lilith is is you know got these additional abilities, and then you get something like this. It's like hmm, is that just, her, just, just within the normal bounds of human yeah. capability, or is that something that's been dialed up? Yeah, you know, it leaves those things kind of ambiguous for you. I would, to be honest, it is true because I mean, people who usually have the, are under constant stress. You know, the, the adrenaline the adrenaline levels are constantly high because of you know stressful mm-hmm. situations, right? The reaction time they can sort of learn to the reaction times to be faster thanks to that. But like for if it's one off things, like the adrenaline, sudden adrenaline can really like you know mm. boost you up. Like it's it's because it's not an unusual thing. So your body's not accustomed, and suddenly you like your senses just go haywire. You basically mm. you're aware of the all the input information that you know you usually take but ignore, and suddenly you're aware of it. Mm. So who knows? Yeah, yeah, as a it definitely could be interpreted the will within the mm. bounds of, of of normal human reaction. But uh, so yeah, so Lilith then uh, yeah. after breaking away from Leah, so it tells them that they need to rebuild. So fighting is pointless, and the decision is up to the jailers if we, if they want to get out. And when Lilith tells them the truth about you no know, and everything, they think she's crazy, you know, totally bonkers. They laugh at her, and. Hmm. Um, she doesn't well she can do all the things on Kali modifiers but they need to remember two things the first one of them is whether they believe them or not they need to act like they're on the ship and they can't escape if they injure it they'll be sent on earth but otherwise they just have to accept that and Leah goes just do as we we're told and wait huh Leah says and unless you li- unless you like it here well enough to stay and Celine as her prescription then starts crying not knowing what to believe and why she's alive which Tate gets from you know a dirty look from Tate and Liv just looks at her coldly and saying basically there's no medical supply so if you if you want to commit suicide go for it you know you will succeed probably and anyway she tells them that they need to stick together and the man will be awakened later and the basics of their life at the moment uh, and tells them where the what the basic of the life, so where to get food, you know, where what she can do, wh- wh- how you know, the, pe- the super capability of the toilets, uh, i.e., eating the rubbish. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, Lilith takes a really hard line with Celine here, right? She's just like, you want to kill yourself? It. It's like, yeah, there's no medicine. Go for like, it. You know, right. you probably will succeed. Lol. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, Lilith. Which yeah, wow. it seems kind of like. Yeah, she's uh, kind of uh, a bit a bit brutal with the truth and the the attitude of, of all this to the. But to be she's, honest, she's Richard, I would take the same attitude. Like, do you believe me or not? Doesn't mm. matter. That's the fact. Lol. Get mm. get used to it. If you know, eventually when mm. things mm. you know yeah. unravel themselves, and you see that, I should be like, don't act surprised because I already told you. Take mm. it. You know, 
Yeah, uh, I suppose we, she does have Celine's history, right? Because she, I think she, she never actually tried to kill yes, herself. Yes, that's correct. She? she actually never right, tried, was, even though uh, if she felt like she, I don't know, maybe depressed. She was depressed, but she never actually tried yeah, to do anything. Like to she'd, herself. she'd expressed like the desire to, like she, she'd kind of had like expressed some kind of suicidal ideation or like not wanting to exist anymore, right? But never actually done anything that like suggested her actions would be That's in that correct. direction so i suppose Lilith has that kind of um assurance as it were that she's not actually likely to to mm. do that um so um her expressing that you know uh, kind of concern and, and uh, like un- unwillingness to deal with it and you know, kind of breaking down just sort of being like harsh and you know, snap out of it kind of an attitude is, is i think yeah not not perhaps as harsh as it might initially come off as given her knowledge of her history I yeah suppose. i guess yeah i guess Lilith knew exactly yeah. what you know well at least knows yeah. what to say to them knowing their background mm. and yeah well the chapter ends with Lilith just telling them the second thing that she was supposed to that they are bas- basically watched all the time the Ankali won't bother mm. coming until either there are 40 of them ready to meet them or until they kill us, uh, you know, they start killing each other. So, and mm. Leah goes, So you're protecting from us, convenient. And it goes, We're protected from one another. We are endangered species, almost extinct. If we're going to survive, we need protection. And that's where the chapter ends. Mm. Yep. And uh, to be honest, it's. Yeah, it's an interesting. Uh, a prospect, right? Think, thinking of uh, themselves as an endangered yeah, species. Yeah, and to be honest, I, it feels to me like Lilith, although I get her attitude because, yes, we are, you know, you're uh, um, kept captive, right? But, like, hmm. the way Lilith was treating, like, the way she describes it to, to, do, uh, to all the rest of the guys, that is, like, hmm. sometimes she's being a bit harsh in my opinion, to... Mm. Well, I mean, yes, there's the trade, you know, uh, there's the trade where it, there are involuntary, basically, decide, you know, the Onkali decided, yes, we are going to combine our genetics together. So... Yeah, that's not really come up in detail yeah, yet. Yeah, it hasn't. Um, but, but like, you know, it's it's still there, right? So she, she I can believe why she would say they're captors and they, they do what they want. But at the same time... Mm. They did quite a lot for Lilith as well, like in a way that it's you know, Nikan. Sh- well, obviously, let's not take Paul Titus into that because that breaks my argument completely. But um, <laughs> it's yeah, there's, there's definitely a sense of, of a certain amount of mixed feelings from Lilith towards <laughs> the Ankali in that. Uh, she describes them there's the three different words that she uses to describe them in this chapter she calls them their captors mm. their rescuers and their jailers yeah so it's like so, can you make up your mind or can you just explain to them yeah. what they really are yeah and and this is it like the the last sentence there that we're an endangered species right she's got a point on the whole rescuers thing right they have potentially saved us from yes. extinction extinction but at the same time what they want to there's do is, is more that. or less render us extinct by assimilation. Yeah, yeah it is. I mean, there's yeah. a price for saving them, and the price is basically perform- doing the trade. Um, hmm. So, well, I don't know. It just feels to me, yeah, it is um, a bit weird, I think, attitude. It depends on how you look at it. Because considering there's some humans that survived with Onkali for the whole of their lives and then they died, you know, um, living between Don Kali, so I don't know. It just feels to me. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I get the impression that, that Lilith has um, like hope for um, it, it, it sort of evading the Don Kali's plan of assimilation. I, I, this is uh, what I'm saying, Richard. This is my long term prediction: hmm. is that there's going to be some sort hmm. of like civil war between. Um, you know, Lilith being the sort of leader of fighting against the Onkali mm. uh, to prevent that trade happening and you know, all that, you know, gen- mo- genetical modifications to the future generations. But like, because, mm. you know, 
Kaguya said to her, you will not understand us. Your gen- your children will, but you will never understand us. And you know, it's and it all shows, you know, mm-hmm. it shows that this whole idea of um being able to well being surviving but then as a payment you have to trade with them becoming fused sort of type of species um Hmm. is the only way to go and then therefore obviously but people obviously will be fight against something different becoming something different that they have no choice of understandable but like yeah it's just Hmm. Hmm. i think the next book is going to be about that (laughs) (laughs) okay Hmm. interesting uh, add this to the prediction yeah list. i mean <laughs> i honestly believe that this book is going to be like by end of the nursery they finally just 40 of them ready to go well maybe not ready to go but like sort of a training uh they sort mm-hmm. of meet down kali at some point and then they finally sort of um get realized that oh shit she's been saying the whole truth all this time and then basically what's going to happen is that they're gonna start to get trained because the last um uh, section is called training uh, we're basically mm-hmm. going to get trained to how to survive on the new earth where you know the species are having modified by the Onkali to survive the nuclear mm-hmm. holocaust so yeah. it's basically the book is going to end up with like them just going on a ship to go to earth and that's the end of the book but the next book is going to be them sort of oh we're on, back on earth mm, right we finally are sort of free from the Onkali's clutches how can we survive this but in reality there's going to be someone Kali obviously with them and the mm. question will be you know who is happy to stay with Don Kali because I'm sure there will be some people who don't mind it and there will be some people who yeah. will be fully against it and then I think Lilith is going to be stuck in between because you know Nikanj and the rest will be there and then she'll be like oh well okay and how, how much kind of four do you chess do you think the Owen Carly are playing with this whole again, thing? Sorry? Like, do you think that they have already? Do you think they've already anticipated that? Like, do you think the Owen Carly are playing a, a long game because they seem very confident well, to be honest, that this is going to go exactly like so they want. far? Everything that um, well, well, two things so far. Owen Carly have shown that they have been able to manipulate live like you know a baby, like a child. That's mm. for that's for sure. And secondly. I'm sorry to say, but how stupid do you have to be to be in a room that's obviously being watched and she just tells them, you know, like the jailers, captors, blah, blah, you know, just tells them, you know, all those things to other humans without even trying to be, like, discreet about it. Like, really? (laughs) So it's like... Mm. Obviously, she's making herself obvious about what she's saying. Unless, unless I don't know, the book is manipulating me right now and just trying to, Lilith, just, you know, pretending to be, or oh, trying to make, you know, oh, yeah, we are captors, blah, blah. But in reality, she actually doesn't mind on Kali. Don't know. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So you think she's letting too much of her hand yeah, show I think on she's the, just... uh, we want to rebel against the one Kali. Yeah, I just... It feels to me like she's being so vocal uh, about it. It's just almost too vocal. Hmm. Interesting. So the the rebuilding stuff you think is uh, well, no, I think the rebuilding too... thing is it makes sense. It's just if I was in her perspective, it's like, well, we are on the ship, we are saved from the nuclear holocaust, the the remaining of us by the aliens, right? The aliens have uh, give us mm-hmm. this uh, choice. We take the trade, as they call it. And we become in future generation a fusion of two different species, and we survive, oh. and that's it. Like I wouldn't call them anything. And then, if you don't like, if you like it so, or not, well, the decision to how to deal with it will be have to be left until we are on the Earth, because at the moment we are stuck on a ship, and leave it at that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm wondering now if if Lilith's approach is actually strategically the the smarter way to go right because she's she's giving a slightly adversarial bent towards her and the Owen Kali which will mean that presumably the humans already feel a certain amount of adversarial relationship between them and the Owen Kali because of the whole like putting them in solitary thing right so she doesn't want them to identify As, her with yeah the I, I think that's the because best approach to be it, honest at this point yeah yeah, so if if she came into ooh yay, the one Kali have rescued us, they're amazing, they're great, they're 
wonderful. You know, that might not go over mm. very well with the cohort that she's working with. And then also the whole, um, like, we were rescued by these tentacle monster aliens. And that's great. Uh, that's already a lot, right? We were rescued by these tentacle monster aliens who want to <laughs> genetically engineer us and make us have weird hybrid children. Uh, yeah, I yes, I see, I see your point. <laughs> it's a harder yeah. sell. That, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, I maybe no. yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe she's just playing the hard ball so that you know they think that it's more of a she's on still on hum, full on humanity. You know, she doesn't ha- she's not happy. But to be honest, I don't know what to think about Lilith at the moment. So mm-hmm. it's it's hard to tell what she's really thinking through. The book is not really giving us any insight of what she's thinking through at the moment. It's yeah, we don't have like a close first person perspective here. We don't really have much it's, insight. Into it's a her bit different to what monologue. the previous chapters were, the sections were, because obviously we know it was description mm. of like how what she's thinking about it, how she's feeling. But at the moment, it's more of like yeah, no, no, this is what it is. Just full, full focus on the new people and their interactions. That's it. Hmm. Yeah, we've we've kind of pulled out a little bit. We've got a slightly uh, wider perspective, um, which is interesting. Yeah, it, it gives us less direct access to the motivations of of all the people involved here. It's more uh, we have to do more inference. Mm. Hmm. So yeah, so I think as a sort of my. Since we talked about the f- uh, far future prediction, I think my next chapter for prediction is that obviously she's going to awaken Kurt Lower and then Joseph Shing. And um, I thought maybe that this sort of awakening, well, obviously, the f- maybe not the first chapter, this chapter, but like obviously there's going to be explanation again, blah, blah, blah. Maybe Joseph Shing will be more understandable to what she's saying, not the whole genetical engineering and the. Um, um, you know the trade and stuff like that, um, but I think mm-hmm. there will be some sort of sexual tension at some point. Like it's 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 bound to happen. There's some issues about to bo- it's bound to happen. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, we don't have any we don't have any men yet, and as far as we are aware, we don't have any uh, homosexual women yet. So there's not yet been any serious uh, sexual tension in the newly awoken group. So the, the- yeah. That might be a a theme in subsequent yeah, chapters. Yeah, so you know, like, but to be honest, it's like sort of what Leah, uh, no, sorry, Tate said before is like, you know, are you trying to awaken a harem for, uh, um, for an expand into our way to, to be awakened? It's just like that sounds a bit foreboding mm. to what may happen. Yeah, and it was it was interesting because a couple of characters. Um, uh, I think both Celine and Tate kind of expressed like, oh, "Why haven't we woken up any men yet?" Um, in this, uh, chapter. it was Celine so was, that asked yeah, uh, when the next uh, when men are going to be awakened, and that's when Leah uh, mm. that Lily yeah. says, and, "Yeah, they're next to be awakened." Hmm. And and Tate was was pushing earlier on, right? She was saying, "You know, you're you're gun shy because of Paul mm. Titus. We should wake up, Kurt." He seems competent, kind of. I thing. think it's more, yeah. Um, obviously, it's more yeah. planned to by Lilith to to get sort of more mm. back um, uh, support. But I, to be honest, just just thinking about this, um, um, the the idea of um, like Lilith, the whole conversation. Oh God, I lost just lost what I lost what I was thinking about. Um, mm. <laughs> it was. A- in, in, there's another thread I just wanted to pick up yeah. before we left. In that, a, a couple of times during this, um, some of the women that Lilith woke up asked, like Lilith, do you, do you have any kids? With like the just, I think I can't remember exactly how it phrased, but it was the distinct like you don't have, you didn't have any kids, did you? Uh, it was Celine kind of who I think uh, did that, but then Lilith told her like, uh, "Yep, I, think, I did." Lol. Yeah, it's so both Celine and Tate. I yes. think did that yes. at one point, um, and it. it it was interesting because that, like the that, I think it helped in harsh that it enforced that kind of a uh, harsh vibe that Lilith seemed to be giving to uh, the other um, people, like this kind of stern, curt, um, hard kind of image that she was seeming to project. Uh, not very 
uh, motherly, I suppose, yeah. it came came off to these people yeah. asking. But yeah, it's it's interesting because yeah, she sort of shot them both down with yeah, I did have a kid. Yeah. yeah. No, actually, I remember now. Um, what I was going to say is that the speed mm -hmm. that uh, Lilith is waking them is something I'm I was mm -hmm. not expecting. Like I was expecting that uh, mm. she will wake them up, the the people like you no know, more slowly trying to get them get used to her and sort of become closer friends instead. But she's waking them up like one after another, nonstop. It's like, wow, it's it's really rapid. Like she is really rapidly waking them all up, and like mm. it's. I was expecting to be more gradual sort of description you know, um, of her awakening and getting to know those people and stuff like that. Hmm. Interesting. Because like, yeah. like oh, but, you know, she walked in the pay for, it, and it I, took three days You know, after she was planned, walking up the uh, women and then the men are supposed to hmm. be awakened almost immediately. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that's an interesting choice. I mean, I suppose there's a there's a certain narrative imperative to keep forward motion there that might drive that. But in terms of the character's motivations, why might they be? Why might she be choosing to to use this pace? Because um, also, you'd think hmm. about it, like you would you say, "Oh, there are aliens on the ship," whether you believe me or not. Hmm. I would really try to if if I was planning, I'd be like, "Yeah, can you like sort of Nikant? Can you show yourself?" And then, like one by one, just to show them, hmm. like, and then, okay, that's Nikanj, that's Nankali. Thanks, Nikanj. Bye. And then yeah. he goes away, and that's then they're point, like, actually. "Oh shit, she's been treating, saying truth all this time." So they have the time to accustom hmm. themselves to that, because you know, when you have forty humans, and suddenly, like, "Oh, you guys are ready? Yeah, I'm gonna show you Nankali," and they all freak out. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think perhaps it. Um, it might be better to have more of them at once from a group dynamics perspective, because then everyone's going to be relatively new all at the same time, and that's not going to be like adding new people to kind of an existing yeah, yeah. group, yeah. as it were, which might be harder to get the additional people to, to gel. Whereas if you kind of throw more people in at once, it, it, you don't generate... Or you, you might be less likely to generate kind of out groups by order of waking them up. Well, yes, maybe. That, that might be. Oh, but then again, point. she is trying to wake mm. up like the, her core 10 people team, sort of. So maybe yes. that's what she's yeah. doing, like at the beginning, yeah. trying to then get used to her, sort of develop a proper group dynamic, mm. and then the rest follow up with that after that. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what the timing's like subsequently. I, I can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, hmm. yeah that's an interesting point yeah your point about the the Owen Carly as well like generating confidence that Lilith is in fact telling the truth about this alien captors thing mm -hmm. I think given the amount of thought she seems to put into the rest of this I think that's one thing that she's actually underestimated it seems like it would be very important to make sure that people are able to like believe that with confidence early on because otherwise you know that's going to generate kind of mutterings of dissent yes, and yes. so on uh, you know like you know, is this lady nuts we should be paying yeah it's a uh, yeah I, I think that's something that uh, perhaps because she's seen it right she's experienced it very viscerally and firsthand it doesn't seem quite as uh, nuts to her as it might to some of the others and she'd even like before um, the Owen Carly told her they were aliens, she'd kind of inferred that there might... She thought that the, the, she you know, had a non-zero probability in her mind that her captors yeah. were aliens, um, which doesn't seem like it's the case for some of the others. Right? They're just like, oh, aliens? No, nah, that's nonsense. But, um, yeah. So the I think she may have underestimated that. I think that might be important. Well... Let's see what happens next. But I think waking up Joseph Shing, who I think was an engineer, if I remember correctly, so he might have some sort of scientific background. So I hope that it sort of leads it to the way that, you know, it's... Okay, I sort of get it. That's technically possible. Let's see. 
honestly, I think she she needed. I I think she should have woken up him after Tate, but uh, after before mm, okay. Leah and Celine, uh, just after Tate. But let's see. Interesting. Yeah, I suppose we'll 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 find out how uh uh how much of our expectations for uh, for Joseph are are to be. I f- I believe in science. Some, I in believe in campus. a scientist. I believe. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the engineer will be great. Yeah. yeah, he'll be the he'll be the one. He'll be the one to lead. No, uh, hmm. the rest. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably shows a, a little bit and, of our own bias, maybe. And it's but, gonna be uh, again like the one of those movies. Basically, the scientist saying one thing, and then basically they ignore him and all die. <laughs> Book ends. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yep. Oh well. Yeah, well, I mean, so far this has not been a very tropey no, narrative, no, it's... right? It, it, I mean, it's not adhered to some of those stereotypes, um, which is good. It's, I think, to be honest, it's it's, it's been, been fine. Uh, but I feel like at the moment the book is sort of we've learned about Onkali and Lilith, but now it's like sort of waking them up. But I feel like at some point there's definitely going to be a drama inbound. Like it's it's like just waiting there in the shadow. Mm. Just sneaking oh, yeah. behind. Yeah, I mean this, like, I mean the the uh, the first part of the book I think has definitely had. We've got a bit more of that almost the, the technical stuff, right? Some of the background, the world building, the context, and this bit here seems like it's going to contain a lot of the the, the character yes, yes. drama because now you know we have a, a cast of human characters that's expanding, and they're in this situation that's kind of very social experimenty where stuff is going to be, I know. A, a conflict is likely to arise in this context, right? So, I wonder. That, that I wonder. Building drama. Um, if there's going to be a situation that will actually require almost the Onkali to intervene, but Lilith is going to manage. Will manage to uh, sort of calm it down or at least solve it. But I think there will might be some situation that the interference might be necessary, almost necessary. Uh, Okay, there's something to, to yeah, add to I your think predictions that at list. Some point we're, which, gonna, we're gonna see an incident that requires. I them think to intervene? there will be at some point in this section there will be a point where she awakens someone, and what happens is the person who awakens just suddenly, you know, chokes, grabs someone who's the closest to them, and just takes them hostage, and then there's like, listen, you have a choice: either just calm down and you know let that person be, like it was with Lilith, or it's gonna go bad, and it's gonna be the point where almost, but not necessarily, but almost the Onkali will have to intervene, but Lilith ma- will manage to sort of um, resolve that situation. Okay, so you don't think the Onkali will be forced no, to intervene? No, no, I think, think they'll be just about, will just about, just about, just about. Okay, interesting. Yeah, nice, nicely specific. I don't know. It prediction. just feels to me like. <laughs> This 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 might happen, like, but as I said, this book can this book can really twist itself in a way that I my predictions are completely useless. So, <laughs> okay then, right? Well, that was a that was a good Episode. long uh, yeah. conversation, I think. Yeah. Right, everyone, thank you very much for listening. We were uh, Xenothesis. You can find all of the sources of our recordings and other websites where the recordings are available on xenothesis.com. I was Michael Glinka. I was Rich Knighton. Bye. Bye.